and welcome. My name is Elisa Trotz from the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto and welcome to our second research seminar for the fall term. Let me begin by acknowledging the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates on indigenous lands and shores of the planet's largest gathering of fresh water. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the meeting place of Takaronto is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in and enter into respectful and caring relations in community on this territory. I'm really delighted to welcome you here today for our second research seminar series and to introduce you to an amazing colleague, um, Dr. Carolyn Hussain, who we're absolutely thrilled has joined us at the University of Toronto from uh, York University. So this is also a welcome to Carolyn, to the University, uh, to the University of Toronto um, and, and you know, an introduction to our institute, to the colleagues whose work intersects directly with yours my own, Professor Mariam Lowe in particular, Professor Kerry Rittick. So thank you and welcome. Um, before we start, I just wanted to let you know about two more seminars that we have coming up um, this term on November 24th. Please join us for the poets, Kinesia Lubrin and Molly Cross Blanchard, who will be in conversation with our own faculty members, Ronaldo Walcott and Judith Taylor. And then on December 3rd, Women and Gender Studies is co-sponsoring a book launch with the Caribbean Studies program. Um, the book launch is for uh, Professor Tammy Navarro, and we will be having a discussion of her book, Virgin Capital, Race, Gender, and Financialization in the US Virgin Islands. So we're going to actually be sending that information out um, in the next week or so. So please keep a lookout on our listserv. And if you haven't joined our listserv as yet, please send us an email to do so. I wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna do a special shout out to Joan Grant Cummings, who uh, made sure that she got Caro's talk out on the Caribbean listserv. And I see that some of you have begun showing up from the Caribbean. Welcome to Vania, David, who is a farmer and is with the Dominica National Council of Women. I wanna shout out Audrey Roberts, who's joining us from the Bahamas. And I want to particularly shout out um, Peggy Antribus, who is dear to so many of us. And for those of you who don't know, Peggy Antribus is actually one of the founding members of Dawn Development Alternatives with, uh, for a New Era with Karen Groen and Gita Sen. So it's just wonderful to have this kind of engagement beyond the academy and for colleagues um, and our students here to be in conversation with you all. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Asmita Bhutani to introduce uh, Dr. Hussain today. Asmita is a doctoral candidate at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and is currently a course instructor at York and the University of Toronto. And we're delighted to welcome Asmita, um, who will be teaching for us next term or third year undergraduate course on gendered labor in a transnational context. Asmita is interested in the political economy of capitalist accumulation and development in the Global South and its relationship with gender, race, class, and caste. Her current research is an ethnographic study examining the gendered lives and platform-based service work outsourced by countries um, such as the US and Canada to India. And in her previous work, she's explored state repression of indigenous women in mining zones. Asmita has published widely on issues of urban working class youth experiences in the service sector, racialized women's care work labor in Canada, and the role of patriarchal violence in capitalist economies. And Asmita, I believe, is working with one of our affiliate faculty members, um, Dr. Kieran, Professor Kieran Merchandani over at OISI. So welcome, Asmita, and I turn the floor over to you now to introduce Dr. Hassan. Thank you so much. And uh, this is very exciting. It is my immense pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Caroline Shanaz Hussain. Before I go on to introduce our amazing uh, speaker and the wonderful many hats she wears, I'd like to preface this conversation with an acknowledgement of the times we live in. We've all seen the horrors of profit-driven capitalist economies and how these have inevitably failed to serve the interests of the masses. 
how financial state or corporate systems did not even bother to address the labor of social reproduction that has amplified in these times for women. Instead, the mainstream economy has only pushed so many women and households into long-term debts, forced them out of jobs, is de-skilling in them into menial exploitative work to sustain their bodies and lives. And of course, however unprecedented the pandemic is, uh, the exclusion, the dispossession and violence inherent in this economy against racialized and indigenous women is not unprecedented. For decades, low wage service work has been overrepresented by racialized women. Million Kang's work comes to mind. Microfinance policies rolled out in countries like India, Bangladesh to empower women, so called empower, deepened their dependence on the state for survival. The exploitative conditions under which immigrant women uh, provide care work in homes and institutions. Um, uh, the exclusion of women from financial control with the, with the digitalization of banking and finance. The organizing of finances around just productive work, so-called productive work, um, Silvia Federici's work comes to mind there, or, or the economic and sexual violence against indigenous women in Peru, in Mexico, or, or even in Canada for mining activities because land is intimately tied to how financialization in a capitalist economy works, right? So financialization of economies for profit of a few has directly impacted and further oppression along the lines of race, gender, class, um, citizenship, and, and so on. Uh, so I guess we, we, we must with an urgency imagine or uh, pay attention to existing alternatives to bring down this accumulation based uh, economy. These alternatives obviously exist. They always have in the thousands of years of history passed on with indigenous knowledge, racialized women's organizing of societies and non-capitalist com community-based organizing that will continue in the present times. These um, solidarity economies and cooperation-based economies rest on the fundamentals of care and, and resources shared by all for all. And Dr. Hossein brings a wealth of knowledge and experiences to take us through these imaginaries, which in her research are very much in the present and not in some distant future. Um, I think her, her scholarship gives hope and the many hats, like I said earlier, she wears are wonderful uh, that complement her scholarship. Um, she, Dr. Caroline Shanaz Hussain is Associate Professor of Global Development and Political Science at uh, University of Toronto Scarborough and the founder of Diverse Solidarity Economies, the DICE Collective. She holds an Ontario Early Researcher Award and her project African Origins in the Social Economy was funded by SHIRK. She's the 2022 Post Growth Fellow alongside global activists and change makers fighting for new inclusive economies. In 2021, uh, that is this year, she delivered the Big Thinking Lecture for Federation for Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, Canada's Hidden Cooperative System. Excellent lecture, by the way, if you've not heard it, it's on YouTube, one can go and watch it. Uh, Dr. Hussain is also an elected board member to the International Association of Feminist Economics, uh, academic advisor at Oxford University Press, and an editorial member of the UN Task Force for the Social and Solidarity Economy. She's the author of Politicized Microfinance, co-author to Critical Introduction to Business and Society, and editor of the Black Social Economy, as well as numerous book chapters that uh, she's written and articles, and also has a forthcoming co-edited book, Community Economies in the Global South by um, Oxford Press. And one of the things I'd add to this wonderful list is the documentary based on Dr. Hussain's work, uh, The Banker Ladies, tells us so much in just few minutes of how economy, reciprocity, trust, and community development can come together. 
Uh, with that, I am not going to be the one standing between you and this amazing talk that we are uh, just about to engage in. I invite uh, Dr. Hossein to take the floor and begin her wonderful talk. Thank you, but Dr. Butari. Um, I'd like to thank Drs. Uh, Kerry Rittick and Alicia, Dr. Alicia Trotz for inviting me to share my research today at the Institute. Um, it's the first time I'm sharing my research uh, with my new community at the University of Toronto. So I'm blessed to be here today. Um, my talk will be on the banker lady. So I'm going to upload that right now. Um, there we go. Okay. So the title of my talk is The Banker Ladies and the Future of Cooperation. It's a topic that I've been working on for, let's say, 10 years. It's a little bit more than that, but I'm in the revisions, second set of revisions for my book. Um, so I welcome any kinds of, of feedback um, today that, that you can give me. Um, would be great. Um, so um, before becoming an academic, I actually worked for a pretty long time in financial development services um, in the international um, development arena, mostly in cooperative development. Um, but one of the most impactful places I worked was in North Philadelphia um, with an African-American led organization called the OIC International founded by Reverend Leon Sullivan. Some of you may know him, he founded the Global Sullivan Principles. And what I learned during that time working with African-Americans was how to do business more equitably, how to co-op international aid um, so that you can actually um, be mindful of the biased allocations that occur in the ways that monies are distributed. And so I spend a lot of my time now as an academic working with other like-minded feminists who are interested in economics and political economy. And I invite all of you that are interested in thinking about issues of property and money and you know, economics in very loose ways to join IAFI and come, come, come to the annual conferences, you're welcome. And so um, as Dr. Butari, explained a lot. I spend, um, I'm, I'm devoting my career to really focused on solidarity economics as it pertains to people of the African diaspora. Um, my book, Politicized Microfinance, um, uh, centered itself on the Caribbean. And so today's work on Roskas is actually an outgrowth of professionalized financial systems um, that's important. But um, the book that's coming out next year called Community Economies that I co-edit with Christabel PJ and Kerala is actually um, a book that looks at Roskas from the global south as a Southern invention. Yes, we use theories on community economies from a lot of feminists in this part of the world. But what's great about that book is that local scholars from different regions in the world are making sure to draw on theorizing that comes from the local environment. And that's really important. Um, my own research, um, um, has been, so the research that I'm looking at is um, uh, financed by the SHRC, which is, you know, for the Canadians know it, but it's a federal granting agency, but I also hold the Early Researcher Award. And this is, this is telling because there was a long time when no one would finance my work. So I was self-financing this work. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that there's lots of room and opportunity for, for people who, for students who are interested in this body of work. So as a feminist, it's important for me, um, I am of Caribbean um, background. I self-identify as a black feminist. My parents immigrated more than 50 years ago here. Um, I live, I grew up precariously across the city. So those of you that are from the GTA um, will know that moving in a short time, th around 13 times back and forth around the city from, you know, York region to downtown, Bathurst and Bloor now is a trendy place, but back then it was really the hub for the Caribbean community uh, back in the 60s. And, um, 
you know, Downsview where I live now was also a stomping ground for my family. And it was only in high school that my parents were able to find a footing in Vaughan, which is north of the city. So precarity was my norm, but also solidarity economies was my norm. And I think that's important to say because it kind of influences the ways in which I look at it. Some people say that I'm very critical of it and I am because I think it has a lot of work to do to be more inclusive. So I'm going to be mindful of time. I'm looking at the clock because I see so many amazing people on the call today that have lots to say in the conversation afterwards. Um, so I might be rushing through, so forgive me if I'm not clear, and I'll make sure to leave my PowerPoint slides with Joe or answer any emails. I will spend a lot of time on Black political economy theory because that's what I'm wrestling with in my book right now, but I couldn't decide between the six findings, so I'll be quick and, you know, it'll be just be really fast about the findings that are emerging along the cases so you have an idea of where this work is going. I make no assumption that people know what ROSCAs are and how what is the solidarity in economy or social economy and why is this relevant to people of African descent. So let me start with a quick definition. ROSCAs is, uh, stands for Rotating Savings and Credit Associations. Um, the short form is ROSCA. Sometimes people call them money pools, but they're mostly known in the vernacular. So depending on where you come from, you'll be familiar with things like meeting turn or SUSU or a CUB or CHIT funds or uh, Communite or Altin or Gameya or Sanduk. So these are just some of the many names that these ROSCA systems are known by. So they're voluntary informal co-ops where members who often belong to the same socioeconomic class um, decide to form a cooperative group, a money group, where they decide on the fixed sum of money that they will pool as a group and they share it out in turn on a specific cycle that makes sense for them, which could be weekly, monthly, daily, whatever makes sense to the group and their governance. And it's for a defined period of time. Um, anyone who wants to know more about that, check out um, Shirley Ardner and Sandra Berman's book on money go rounds. Um, but where do ROSCAs actually fit into the social economy? And I'm just showing you a Venn diagram, um, the late Jack Quarter, who was at Boise and his colleague Ann Armstrong at Rotman, as well as Lori Moog have um, created this, this Venn diagram that's very familiar in the solidarity economy and more specifically so for Canadians and Canadians concerned about economic development and aid. And so when you look at their Venn diagram, what you see is this interaction or what they call bridging, where the social economy, the best parts of the social economy interacts with government and the private sector. But there's also a part of the social economy that does not engage with those formal actors, the civil society. And I put that black dot there so that you can see where these banking co-ops, these informal co-ops called ROSCAs are situated on purpose in the informal and often detached from government and the private sector. And I think that that's something that's missing in when we speak about the social economy, we don't think about the exclusions that are occurring. And what's important here is that these informal peripheral cooperative institutions are often missing in the narrative when we think about what cooperation and economic cooperation looks like. It's as though we have a kind of a cultural, I don't know, amnesia of sorts. But it's important to remember, and history tells us this, that Canada's sacred social economy sector um, started off informal. The Desjardins movement um, is Desjardins, many people will know of it. It's fifth or sixth largest financial retailer here in Canada, but they have global reach. Started off informal. It started off with these caisse populaire in uh, Lévis, Quebec, because the French Catholic speaking minority felt oppressed by the sea of Anglophone Protestant, Protestants. And so they created these informal caisse populaire to re react against that exclusion. Similarly, during the Great Depression, out east in the Maritimes, Catholic, rogue Catholic priests started mobilizing fisher folk to contest 
through a series of kitchen table meetings in people's houses to discuss the importance of cooperation and credit unions. And then you saw a spread of that happening in Eastern Canada. So these are the narratives that we teach and we think about when we think of international development and cooperation. But what's missing from that story is the Underground Railroad. Curtis Haynes, uh, an economist at Buffalo State, has done a lot of work on Du Bois's cooperative um, legacy. And Du Bois has over and over again um, defined the Underground Railroad as a network of cooperative institutions that had to operate in the informal and hidden away to get people to safe passage. Similarly, people of African descent immigrants who arrive to these lands, who have been coming for a very long time, participate and bring the Rosca systems where they go. And it's kind of borrows on the ideas of historian Maurice St. Pierre, who reminds us that just as African people brought over um, music and art and food um, um, systems and knowledges that they have, they also brought over the ways in which they think about money and business. And so what I'm doing is sort of in this emerging, I call it an emergent theory called the black social economy. Um, I wanted to make sure that I un really located in the application and the practice of the banker ladies who organize these Roscas, because this is a deliberate politicized act of cooperation that stands to confront individualized commercial banking. And this is not by accident, right? Many people are doing this and taking risks as they, as they organize this way. But the 2013 wasn't enough book, um, article wasn't enough. Um, I like this photo because it was sent to me by Instagram by a community person in Baltimore working on collectively, he has a collectively sort of mutual aid black financing institution. And they see the black social economy as really um, co-opting goods to self-finance one another. And that's where I am right now with really trying to theorize about what the black social economy is, but it's also about leaning in on the endless supply, I say, of black and feminist um, political economy that is happening that is really relevant to solidarity economics. And so here, part of my work, and you'll see why I need good theory, because I'm speaking to hundreds of people about Roscas so that we can learn from them. And unlike politicized microfinance, I'm not triangulating my data because that was a con controversial piece of work I had to do. <laughs> but in the Banker Ladies book, I just want to talk to the women who know firsthand about how these systems operate. And so you can see across country context, um, there's more Jamaican voices and Canadian voices. And I have to kind of highlight the Canadian voices are very diverse in terms of who self-identifies as Black and what that looks like. But I do want to say I only interviewed people in the Toronto and Montreal area. So two of Canada's financial centers, and that was also done on purpose. And so if you're speaking to hundreds of people, and I should also say that these are the banker ladies, the ones who organize these Roscas. And so Roska groups can range anywhere from about 10 to 80 people with the exception of Haiti. You can literally have hundreds of people in a soul in Haiti. So, I mean, if you think about it, that 400 that I'm speaking to, the numbers are quite high. I interviewed a, Jang, a Cameroon Jangji banker lady here in Toronto. She had upwards of a thousand members across Canada. So this is serious business that's happening. It's not a figment of my imagination when I think about Roscas in the Canadian context. So I needed good theory. Um, to unpack and um, to analyze. And what I found is, <laughs> and even though I'm on the UN task force, people struggle to find literature of, of what Black political economists are saying, and there is a lot of it. But I'm going to just highlight some of them that um, really guide me along, and that would be Cooney's economist, um, an African-American scholar by the name of Jessica gordon Nemhard, who wrote Collective Courage, speaking about the practice and thought of African-American cooperative institutions, both informal 
and formal. And this will make sense why I'm stressing the informal in a second. Nina Banks um, takes a lot of hits for the work that she does. Uh, she complains to within the progressive circles, particularly with heterodox economists and feminist economists who are very concerned about care economy, but don't even blink at um, the kind of activism and community labor that black women are doing and Hispanic women are doing in the US and has called for the remuneration of that work and so that it is counted. Marcus Garvey um, has been very foundational in all of my books and writings that I do because he was a practitioner of cooperatives. He formed the largest member-owned institution called the UNIA and dozens of cooperative types of institutions and had to face the consequence of that organizing. C.Y. Thomas in Guyana, I studied under him when I was a doctoral student. His legacy still stays with me, particularly his theory of convergence. I'm working on a paper with um, a scholar by the name of Kadasi uh, series at the University of Ghana, and we're resurrecting his contributions to the Canadian economic development sector, um, particularly if those are interested in um, indigenous economics um, called the Nietzsche principles. So the findings. I think I'm doing okay on time. Um, the findings are six and I'm gonna run through them. So bear with me. Um, I had to find findings that I think that spread across the cases. And then also that would um, show you a little bit about the divergence that's happening based on cultural context. And so one of the most important findings across for the African diaspora women and what they're saying to us is the, the idea of democracy building from the ground up. The fact that they are very focused on consensus, they use the vote when needed, but most of their decision-making in these Roskas is happening through consensus, which is very interesting. Um, there is a major um, um, emphasis on camaraderie, um, making sure that people belong, not just in, are included, but they actually feel like they are a part of a system. Um, so the social dimension is important. If you've ever been to a Raska event, um, plan on spending a day there because it involves a lot of food and um, 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 uh, laughs actually. It's a, it's a really great environment for bringing people up who are often beaten down by a system. And that's a part, that's on purpose. That's part of how banking is done in these Raska systems. And what I like about these Raska systems too, is that they also push against the critical feminists and critical economists who think that um, the retreat of aid puts more onus or burdens on poor people to do for themselves. But what I'm learning from the banker ladies is that actually their activism their contributions to community development will always be there, regardless of whether aid is there or not. And this, they sort of push against this idea that they are a coping mechanism or that they play into this idea of bootstrap development. So the idea is that they hold themselves accountable and that their systems are very participatory. Um, Mummy from Grenada, um, is telling us that solidarity economics matters. Get a banker lady who you know and trust will give you a lump sum of money because people have faith in what you can do with that money. It's not like you have to go beg and borrow for a sum of money because people will question you. You're actually working with people that you know and trust. That's the key word here. And that together they come together. This is like the core of the solidarity economy. So it's baffling that we keep erasing these historical African cooperative types of systems that have such great meaning and can really instruct us to do huma humane types of business. The second finding across the spectrum, the women who use the, these Roskas love them. You always hear this, me love me partner. I mean, constantly you hear this kind of stuff. They are so well respected. They are so revered. It almost gets to a point where they become defensive of them. There are risks 
and I can talk about them during the Q and A. And there are because anything informal, there is a there's a degree of risk. But it almost becomes when you interview these women, they become protective of them because this is often sort of the thing that's always there for them when nothing else is. So they'll always cite Roskas as being sort of the most one of the a very valuable lifeline to the ways that they live their lives, including Black women here in Canada. And this actually aligns with larger research that's being done in the global south. So from you know, Bangladesh and Kenya and India and South Africa, they measured um, financial diaries of literally hundreds of people and found that the Chit and the Stockville and the Itiga, these are all names of Roskas that keep topping the, the, the financial device that most people rely and depend on. Caribbean bankers, commercial elite bankers in the region will copy and mimic the Rosca system. So many of you maybe already know that some banks have the partner plan or they have the mama soul plan. The bank ladies will tell you they're nothing like the systems they have. But the very fact that commercial bankers see the value and the affinity that these women have in it with these Rosca systems and then will try to mimic it in a commercial setting is quite telling because this is not happening in the Canadian context. And so before I show you the documentary, I do want to say, like, I'm just gonna show you a little clip. Um, it was done by a Toronto-based Haitian Canadian by the name of Esri Mondesir. He does fantastic work. Um, so I give him all the credit for this, for telling this story. Um, but what you're going to see here is that Roscas are also valued and cherished in Canada. But also, so if you have it in your country, you still bring it. So when you go, you meet people from your country, you say, oh, you remember also? So they say, yes. You remember when we used to do it back home. So why don't we do it back? So we developed a structure that was different, slightly different than the one that my mom and her friends used. A new club means L. And we have a beautiful thing as women. So $200, I get the $2,000. That makes me independent. I feel a power. It's absolutely. So that film is actually on Films for Action. If someone wants to drop the link in the chat, go ahead. It's open access. It was done on open um, by open access, open access because the la banker ladies told me to make a movie instead of being a useless academic that just writes articles that are behind a paywall and really boring academic work that doesn't reach them and can't change mindset. So I also now <laughs> publish, because I don't want to be a useless academic, I publish in cultural venues and newspapers and um, hate doing so because of the after effects when other readers have them. But what I'm trying to do, they're right, change mindset, use all this education that they have, they have helped for me to have and to make a difference um, in the ways that we acknowledge that Canada's social economy has these vibrant systems of Roskas. And so there is a divergence. What I'm getting to in the third finding is that there is a major divergence from the Caribbean banker ladies. And it's not about the systems. I was so fixated on the mechanics of Roskas to realize that that's not the difference between the Canadian and the Caribbean banker ladies. The difference is that Canadian, the Canadian system is in complete denial. We don't want to see that these systems exist. In some ways, um, COVID has unleashed this idea that mutual aid is, has been born again. And so now at least we can value why informal systems actually are really, really important. And so, the, the divergence has been that in the Caribbean, people see and value and cherish their banker ladies for their ingenuity in business. In the Canadian context, we vilify them. We call them names like terrorists. How many Sudanese women and, and Somali women have to tell me that they are being 
seen as terrorists and money launderers to fund Al-Shabaab. Others tell me that they are ridiculed and seen as gambling or um, um, drug muling involved in illicit drug activities. And the police will, when they raid their apartments blocks, will confiscate these monies that are for raskas. They are partner or their meeting turn hands or their ayutu money but they are being stigmatized. 90% of the women I interviewed in the Canadian context who are banker ladies will tell you they are stigmatized. The other 10% are too fearful to even answer that question because they're afraid of a reprisal, of being sent back home or for being arrested. This is a real fear that's existing here now today. And that what they do is actual resistance. They are resisting. They are. They see themselves as taking risks when they participate in something that is a part of Canada's tradition, which is collectives, cooperatives, mutual aid, right? That's what we sell to the world. But yet we don't want to remember that these women are contributing to that amazing legacy. And so the resistance is also that they're pushing against this idea of commercial business because they choose the collective. We don't see the work of the Canadian banker ladies. And at first I thought it's because they're so informal and that they hide themselves. I'm getting to the point, um, and that's where my review is stuck. <laughs> I'm getting to the point that I believe that we don't see them because we don't want to see the work that they contribute to our financial economies. We know that these systems of Roskas exist. We have the Underground Railroad to prove that. We have the true bands when people settled in Southern Ontario and tapped into financial groups. And we know that immigrants from all kinds of cultural backgrounds practice these systems. We have a century of doing Roskas in this country alone, even probably even longer. But we choose not to see them. The fourth finding, is this quiet resistance. Um, and I think Haiti is a really great case to think about um, the resistance that Roskas, that the women who practice Roskas are doing. Um, Haiti has been doing uh, forms of cooperation, usually in the informal, to topple colonizers, to get rid of dictators, um, and to continue leaving, um, living when there is complete chaos and crisis. When there was US occupation in Haiti, they formalized their cooperative system. No foreign entity had to teach Haitians how to be cooperative. Even though we like to tell people that, that Caribbean and diaspora and African people don't understand cooperatives in the formal sector, but they don't understand. They actually have built these systems. This makes my job easy, right? Um, uh, there is a political scientist, a Haitian, um, who's uh, called Robert Faton. I think he's at Virginia Tech. He is like the foremost authority on authoritarianism, but he'll always say that Haiti is not void of democracy. You just have to look in the local arenas, in the grassroots communities, to find the abundance of combite, groupement, and all of these system pratiques. Check out Gina Ulysses' book, uh, sorry, movie, that she did with Mark Schuler called Potomitan. I saw that at a CSA meeting in Jamaica. And ever since then, I've been her personal agent promoting this film because it shows how women, Haitian women, will drop out of sweatshops, get active in their soul, which is soul is a, is a Raska, so that they can do small business and then have more time to do the advocacy work that they that they need to do in their community. Another quiet form of resistance is coming from the banker ladies in Toronto. And it has to do around sort of the digitizing of money and thinking that we have to do things through ATMs and online. And um, what I'm hearing from the banker ladies is that it, particularly those who live in lower income communities here in the Toronto area, as commercial banks retreat out of their communities, they're left with nothing often but an ATM machine. And so 70% of them will have to use the ATM machine. 
they're not thrilled about doing that and they have plenty to say in the focus group and I record all of that. But 22% of them will make that travel and they will stand in queues and do their banking. In terms of online banking, when I first started this research, virtually no one was doing online banking. Um, but that has changed. Um, in my last set of interviews in 2018, I found that about a third of them were doing that. Um, a lot of it has to do with digital divide, not having reliable internet in your house. It's also that people come from places, they're not comfortable with using technology to do banking. They think it should be a personal thing. So they try to convince me that banking on a computer is stupid, that you should actually meet people and talk about money. Um, and um, the ones that do can often be younger in generation. And also the ones who may be older, who are not as comfortable, rely on their children. So you can imagine the host of complaints that come out of relying on your Canadian kids to help you do online banking, right? Another form of quiet resistance is that when people live in complex areas um, that have, you know, um, certain abuses, uh, you know, again, racial, gender, um, class discrimination that's occurring, um, that people have an alternative sort of homegrown banking system that they know. So the narratives in the places that I traveled like Trinidad and Guyana, at the times that I was there, it was very hostile towards people of African descent, people mixed with African, um, um, mixed uh, Douglas, really facing a lot of horrid um, exclusions. And so for them, having access to a box hand was a way to sort of restore their own dignity. It was a way to also make it clear that they actually have an entrepreneurial spirit because they're often denigrated as being, you know, dependent on handouts and what have you. So pushing against that idea. Um, in, in where partisan politics becomes complex, um, where microfinance institutions may collude with political elites and people who, banker ladies who don't want any part of that nonsense will throw a partner because partners done by people, your neighbors, maybe your family members, extended family members, friends, who knows, but it's people that you live with who know and understand the realities and partner gives them an opt out card basically to be binded to any sort of informal act boss or, you know, corrupt politician or what have you. The other um, fifth finding that uh, that is that has emerged, and I'm really, I, this this part I find very exciting, is the the global contributions. Um, and I definitely want to thank um, Alicia Trotz for giving me a place in her Starbuck newspaper. And P.S. I'm um, uh, people in my life actually think now that I work when I publish in uh, papers that they actually know about. <laughs> they think that I'm quite a celebrity now because I published in the Starbuck newspaper. Um, but I think that that piece is important in that it, it made me think about the gratitude that we owe. We should say thank you to the Caribbean people. We should say thank you to African people for bringing these financial cooperatives here right? Because they're assisting us. And if you read this quote, I'll give you a second to do that. Fidosa, a Somali-born Canadian, is basically saying, I'm going to take credit for these hagbad, which is a Raska, system. People will think it's weird and associated with our culture. She's like, yeah, that's okay associated as a cultural contribution that we bring to the Canadian society to help all of you. That's pretty amazing. They're taking credit. And you know what? We're going to teach you how to humanize banking because we're going to share tea and have delicious fish samosas along with it. And I think that this is the way that bank, this is a major global Southern invention that we should be appreciative of. Um, here are women taking informal ways of dealing with money and making sure that they do self-help on their own terms. If there are students on this call who are looking for a topic, 
here's one. And it excites me as a political scientist, because when we think about commoning of financial goods or any kind of goods in sort of the ideas of Eleanor Ostrom and the ideas of governing the commons, Roskas are doing that. Here is an informal money banking system that is allowing black women to participate and run in a political, a formal political process. Now that's beautiful, right? Like, so Munira ran against Doug, the late Doug Ford in Etobicoke North. Some of you may have remembered her campaign signs were vandalized and it made the Toronto star. But she told, confided in me that Ayutu was her first seed money, that's a Somali Roska, to be able to run and to pay the certain mandatory fees because she didn't have that capital in a lump sum at her disposition. Recently, I got a WhatsApp message from Andrea Barnett, who was the former executive director of the Canadian Black uh, Chamber of Commerce. She's running um, out of her Brampton riding and used a pot in a hand to get the first tranche of money and was showing me her beautiful election signs that she used that lump sum of money to pay for. So this is what's exciting here, right? Is that now Roscas that are informal and hidden away are now an opportunity for black women to represent us in, in the political arena. My sixth and last finding, and then I will stop, um, um, is remembering what we have. Um, know that there is a wonderful legacy of um, understanding Roscas outside of a Western context. Um, I traveled to Ethiopia and Ghana as well, um, and India to understand um, Roscas that have been around for hundreds of years, sometimes on the books um, in places like India and, and Ghana. And Ghana has centuries literally of doing the SUSU system. And so I traveled there and I work with uh, Professor Sami Kweku Bonsu at Gimpa, the University of Ghana. And right now we're working on a paper about the tiny aspect of the SUSU system that is dealing with formality. I was so impressed by the Ghana SUSU collectors and cooperative network in Accra that after three times of being <laughs> rejected for his visa to come to Toronto to talk to our banker ladies, he finally came and was able to have that conversation about how they did um, formality and what does formality look like for a very small segment of the SUSU sector. And they're taking on a very pragmatic approach because they're not interested in formalizing the entire Roska system in Ghana, which is quite clever. Um, but anyways, those are photos from the Ghana. So when we think about the future of cooperation, the ways in which we think about economic development, I believe that the banker ladies who organize these Roska systems have plenty to instruct international and global agencies, as well as Canada's federal agencies interested in global development, but also interested in community economic development among underrepresented groups here in Canada. And I think that the banker ladies can be instructive on both levels um, because they have much to say about what cooperativism looks like, particularly in contexts where we are grappling with things like anti-Black racism, inequities, class bias, and what have you. Um, we choose not to see the work of the banker ladies, right, in here in Canada. In the Caribbean, they do see the banker ladies, but both in the Caribbean and in Canada, we don't pay them, we don't remunerate them, we make them do this work for us for free. They're using after-tax incomes of their own volition. They subsidize a lot of their Roska events, meetings, parties, whatever you want to call them, to build up civic society. And we don't include them in our economic development plans. So the proposal here today, and what I will do next week, is to ask policymakers, and I'll probably spend my life, <laughs> hopefully I won't fail on all of this, but my life's mission is really to move forward with building a Roska network of some sort. So if people are interested in doing that, I don't know what it's gonna look like. I know we have to set up councils of banker ladies who actually know this stuff. 
Um, so I have to figure out how to move from academic writing to more policy writing. Um, but the good news is I don't have to start from scratch. We can actually go to places in the global south and instead of us exporting our quote unquote knowledge there, maybe they need to bring us their understanding of how to do equity in this context. And I would point to South India Kerala system, very renowned for its gender equality and their Kundambashri system. I wish there were some Indian, some of my Indian colleagues here because they could really speak to that state sponsored program that is concerned about remunerating and including low caste religious minorities to become a part of their development program. And they incentivize policymakers to do that. The Ghana Susu system and its pragmatic approach to only formalizing a part of the SUSU system. But just as you can recognize microfinance banks, they are recognizing commercial banks, co-ops, non-financial banks like NGOs who do banking. Why They of course say, we're gonna recognize our indigenous banking systems too, both formal and informal. And we have lessons to learn and can borrow from the expertise of um, the Stockville National Association in South Africa. They have a lot of work. They invest a lot in capacity building of stock bells. They're right now, which I find very hard work, is trying to make sure there is some sort of education um, campaign to distinguish between paradigm scheme or pyramid schemes and um, the, the stock bell system, because often people will confuse those systems and try to dupe people in thinking they're doing a stock bell in this pyramid. So they're doing that kind of sort of combating the confusion that exists in the industry. So that's kind of an interesting approach to what a Roska network could look like. What could it look like in Canada? What could it look, what could a global one look like for the world? Particularly when cooperatives have a hard time including Roskas as part of their global, you know, sector. And so if I can wrap this up, I believe that to recognize the Roskas, um, the banker ladies um, who do this work will mean that we'll develop, international development will have to change. Um, we will have to change in terms of how we do economic development here at home, but also how we export this, you know, political economy advice overseas. Because we actually do, once we start seeing the work of the Roska women, we'll have to include them. And that's a photo, by the way, of a um, Canadian-based Rosca. They're Sierra Leonean Canadians here in the West End, and they're called Sisterhood. So I get all kinds of wonderful photos from people after they have their meetings. And I think this was sometime, you know, when we opened up a bit during the pandemic, they had met. Um, so um, if I leave you with a few things, it would be that we need to acknowledge the work of Roskas as part of the cooperative sector. Right now, they are ignored. People say that they don't know that they even exist. And why would they exist in Canada when we have so much formality going on? I say hire the banker ladies, hire women who actually do this day in, day out. And it's a lifeline for their livelihood needs. Not people who are doing it as spectator sport, but actually know the practice of Ros Roskas. Credit and cite feminists who are writing on political economy. I can't tell you how many uh, committees I sit on and constantly I'm being told that black feminists or black economists are not really writing on the solidarity economy. They're more sociologists, they're more work, uh, social work, they're humanities. I mean, anything to kind of make sure that they're not in <laughs> the economic sector and it's rubbish or political science. They don't even wanna recognize that um, there is a, a huge body of literature. Uh, the other thing I wanna cite here is that, um, you know, Nina Banks, um, an economist out of Bucknell has done a tremendous amount of work on, on, on um, unearthing stories about hidden economic figures and has taken a lot of abuse and just people not citing her work um, uh, because they don't want to. They will, um, you know, and this is happening, unfortunately, 
uh, with a lot of rigor throughout economics and political economy. So what I'm saying here and what's helpful is that these women are showing up and they're saying that we do these systems, whether you wanna see us or not, we'll continue doing them. And I think that goes for feminists who are working in this field. And finally, I ask students on this call, if you're interested in thinking through what a Roska network could look like, if you wanna join this, please be in touch. Mm, thank you for taking the time today to listen to me on your Wednesday. Um, that's where you can reach me. And if you have time to hang out, I'm going to be in person giving this lecture in, at the University of Guelph, but mostly to international development studies folks um, and the IDRC. And with that, I conclude and thank you. And here is what I'll leave you with are the many vernaculars that Roscas are known by, and they're very much a part of this cooperative sector, but in their own right. I thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, stay on video there. And I don't know if you want to take the, you can leave that up for another minute or take it down. Okay, great. This was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. You're just so full of dynamism and energy and you know the range of your, your um, talk and your expertise across these geographies, across institutional sites from the academy to, um, to the community, to policymaking spaces, to banking spaces. It was just really wonderful. And I think everyone also really appreciated um, the ways in which you track these intellectual, and by intellectual, I'm thinking organic intellectual genealogies of knowledge production through folks who never sort of make it in or sort of get cited in these standard ways. Um, we in, I'm going to ask the, my, my, um, the technical folks on the call to turn